Robbie Diamond, President of SAFE, Securing America's Future Energy. Great title. Are you fulfilling uh, that, that uh, mission that you're on? I think uh, I think we're doing a great job, although it's still a tale of two cities. I mean, we should look. America's production is an all-time high for its uh, oil. That really worked for you. I think that that's great. And if you one looks at uh, demand um, for oil in the country, certainly uh, we've been using it more efficiently uh, than we have in the past, and that's a good thing as well. The sure. question is, is can we maintain those two trajectories? Continue to uh, produce uh, oil as well as uh, use it efficiently and then the third leg of the stool which I think is the biggest open question and maybe the most important thing is how do we bring alternatives into the market so we're not totally dependent on oil how do we get natural gas and natural gas vehicles how do we get you know electricity and electric vehicles and other types of fuels into the transportation market so we're what, not hostage what are, are the other alternative fuels you're interested in I mean we where we want to be uh, technology neutral and let the market decide as much as possible. But uh, if one looks at it, there's certainly natural gas, um, which can be great for some transportation uh, methods, maybe, maybe everything. But heavy duty trucks, I mean, perfectly suited for natural gas. There's a few uh, filling stations. They already have the, the engine for the trucks. Um, electric vehicles using electricity, which is abundant and uh, uses domestic fuels, maybe mostly for light duty vehicles, cars. Um, you know, biofuels uh, for airplanes, uh, drop-in biofuels. Uh, ultimately, hydrogen could play in the mix. So there's so many out there, and it's amazing that we're really hostage to one fuel source in transportation, and we shouldn't be hostage any longer. You know, you say hydrogen, it makes me flinch mm -hmm. because I remember <clears throat> kind of the, the short life of the dirigible. Mm -hmm. And you remember what happened there, I mean, at Lakehurst, New Jersey, right, and and all, but hydrogen to me, I'm not comfortable with that fuel. Well, like I say, the market will serve, will yeah, change not, over time. You're not going to use it if it's dangerous. Yeah, absolutely not. That's I mean, we're right. looking for safe, um, secure fuels, domestic yep. fuels, and diverse. But it fuels. does cause me to backtrack to that period. I think that was like the mid '30s. Right. Well, like everything else, things uh, have changed over time. Technologies get safer. So once again, I, I just think like we should allow Americans to choose. And the problem now in transportation is Americans have no choice. They have to go and fill up. It's either gasoline, gasoline, or gasoline. That's it. That's it. But why did it happen that way? You know, uh, look, for a long it time. It mandated gasoline. It certainly wasn't. In the early days of cars, they had a choice to make. Um, and they were choosing and gasoline won out. Look, gasoline, I think someone has, and oil, someone has to have huge respect for. It carries a lot of energy in a very small uh, packets and it's easily transportable. So to take it out as, and to bring in alternatives is a huge challenge because or it oil is. does naturally something so perfectly well. Because one thing, people hate change. Right. They, it, it just, they don't want it. Look, if, if, uh, if we didn't have other problems with oil, right, uh, global instability, the people who we don't like have it and are, you know, we're paying for it, I wouldn't be in this business. I wouldn't think we'd have to do anything. Oil does what it does very well. But the problem is, is that our geopolitics, our military policy, our foreign policy, our, e our economy are totally wrapped up in this commodity that we have very little control over on a global scale. But we... When you say a global scale, today mm -hmm. the United States <coughs> is energy independent. You know, that's true, but at the same time the price is determined on a global market. And so, yes, there's different now grades. You say that, yeah. and you've got a $10 spread, mm -hmm. an R between Brent North Sea, right. global price, mm -hmm. and West Texas Intermediate. Okay, but what are consumers paying? So even when, uh, even when the spread was bigger, the actual gasoline at the pump was determined by the global price or the highest fuel source, and so the refiners were keeping the spread. And so uh, they, I think about consumers and uh, well, that. The United States has the cheapest fuel in the world. Absolutely. Yep. You agree on that? Yes. And it could be cheaper, but watch out on on the oil price. So so but, actually, actually, I'm going to go back and say. 
the other countries are producing their oil, many countries like Saudi Arabia, at a cheaper price. It costs them much less money to pull it out of the ground than we have it do in the United but States. But the Saudis have a social they do. commitment, which they, you know, people say, well, it doesn't cost them $5 a barrel. Hey, it's going to cost them, when they tell you they got to have $90 a barrel to meet their, their social commitments, right. their budget, they're telling you the truth. Right. That, that's a true story. So, but here, you, the only way you can actually reduce the price of gasoline mm -hmm. is by having a competing fuel right. that's cheaper. And natural gas is, just like you pointed out. I mean, it's, uh, it's really a shame your heavy-duty trucks in America aren't on natural gas. That's the natural place for the natural gas to go. But hard to believe when uh, such a good technology is in place and we can make this happen pretty quickly that we don't have the national will to make it happen. But you, you don't have the leadership right. is what it is. And it, it could happen. But it's, it is happening. Like Raven uh, Trucking from Jacksonville, Florida. The other day they have 500, over 500 uh, 18 wheelers and they said all of them are going to LNG. Right. And they received their first 150 from Peterbilt. Oh, oh, oh Rusty Roush right. is the biggest Peterbilt dealer in the United States. And he markets Peterbilt trucks about over 30% of them. And he is very interested in natural gas for those trucks. But that's a 12 liter engine right. that they have, and it's a new 12 liter engine uh, from Cummings. So first of all, we have you to thank. I mean, based on your... Um, oh, you're really being generous now. Well, you know, uh, look, you, you, you started and backed one of the, the, the companies that can make this possible, and you've spent countless hours in your own capital just telling the country that this is a big problem, and I think that leadership is, uh, is hugely important. Yeah, and right. those country companies probably wouldn't do it if you were not in, in this uh, sort of game or whatever you want to call it, well, this serious you mean, business. You, you look at, at one of your backers at SAFE, yeah. Fred Smith. Yep. I mean... If you started naming uh, the five best leaders in the United States, he'd be in the top five, maybe number one. Maybe we can convince him to run for president. Oh, I was, would that be? Would that be great? If you, I, I'm not being funny. Right, I'm uh, being very honest. I'm, me too. Yeah, Fred Smith is a very patriotic guy. He's a Marine, and a very, very smart businessman. So, so one thing I think worth pointing out is not just about price of oil, but also the volatility of oil prices. And I think that's a big danger for this country and for the world. So the CEO of United Airlines had a great quote. To paraphrase him, I'm Jeff Smizek. He said, you know, I can run a profitable airline at $50 a barrel, and I can run a profitable airline at $150, but they're two totally different airlines. They have different routes, different planes. And right now, with the price dropping 56% over a four-month period after you know, OPEC makes a decision in Vienna, um, you know, not only our supply, our producers, you know, experiencing the pain, but all the natural gas, you know, vehicle companies. But OPEC didn't drop the price. I didn't say they dropped it, but. We dropped it. It was an industry in the United States. Right, we, but just the volatility which comes from geopolitical problems comes from, look, even not making a decision is making, making a decision. So I just think the over, you've been in the oil business all your whole life, uh, as you know, the prices swings rapidly, and that swing is very dangerous for consumers, Americans, and businesses to plan ahead. And if we had more choice in the fuel market, That's we right. might have more stable pricing, and we wouldn't see companies go bankrupt. And but you're going to be back at seventy dollars a barrel by the end of the year, right? Because you shut down all the drilling rigs in the United States. And so this yo-yo is a big problem. And I think by having this fuel choice, we won't have to experience that. Well, when OPEC, uh, you say, one cartel, mm -hmm. and they control the price. No, their swing producer does, yes. Saudi Arabia. The others produce max out all the time. Saudis have some, I don't think, as much uh, unused capacity as they claim. Right. All right. Uh, but when they announce mm -hmm. this time, we are not going to cut. Mm -hmm. to stabilize the market. Mm -hmm. They meant it. Uh, the, Naomi, I think, is an honest, credible person. Right. And his reputation is important to him as mine is to me. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, if I told them I wasn't going to cut, I'm not going to cut. They didn't cut mm -hmm. and shifted the swing producer to the United States. Right. And we took care of the price and the oversupply by shutting down the rigs, which is a normal market reaction, a free market reaction. Right. And so, so I, you know, look, it's a clumsy cartel, but it is a cartel, and sometimes they'll have more power and sometimes they have less power. And uh, hard to know, you know, why decisions are made, but I just say that the volatility, which we've seen over a 40 year period, sure. since the market changed and OPEC had the first oil embargo, has, you know, seen our companies, you know, um, CEOs been fired, companies merge, you know, new technologies die on the vine. Um, and so we just need to find a way to have this choice. So like how we produce electricity, there's lots of different fuels in transportation. We shouldn't have, be hostage to one. And th that's what we're working towards. And I think that the market, even with U.S. supply, is still going to be volatile um, because of the nature of the market. And so we still should be doing what we're trying to do of getting new fuels onto the onto, onto Competitive the fuel. Competitive fuels into transportation. I agree with you 100 percent. The having said that, that uh, uh, it's interesting the way things have gone in the Mideast, mm -hmm. where now the United States does not need oil from the Mideast. Mm -hmm. And we're stuck there because we have a very, very important partner. Right. And that partner needs always needs our assistance. And so, but we went there because of oil. Do you remember how far back that goes? Um, is in the, well, certainly the Carter Doctrine is uh, is something that's famous in the oil markets. But it started uh, on the isn't it the uh, either the aircraft carrier when um, the Saudi princes met with uh, the president of the United States and talked about um, the U.S. role in the in the region, right? I didn't know of that. I know of this the mm -hmm. Arab embargo. Right. Was when Washington, I think, decided that we were always going to be dependent on Middle East oil, mm -hmm. and from there, the Fifth Fleet was based out of Bahrain, and we went into the area, and we've been there ever since. Right. And uh, it, it's interesting because uh, we don't need the oil, which uh, this geologist would have right. <laughs> if he had asked me 20 years ago, 10 years ago, would we ever be mm -hmm. have plenty of oil in America? I would have said, no, we're declining, and we will never recover from the decline. Right. At that point, we were down to 4 million barrels a day. Today, we're 9.5 million. Right. Unbelievable right. what the industry did. And that, again, is our system, the capitalistic system, does pay off. Right. It does make things happen. Absolutely. And, and it did. So, okay. What do you want to talk now, about? Now, but sometimes, you know, we need um, our system to help get some of these newer technologies that will provide this sort of long-term stability over the, you know, over the, the hump, through the valley of death, because um, sometimes there are chicken-egg problems, there's infrastructure issues. Yeah, but you know what your problem is yeah. on that? Yeah. Washington doesn't understand energy. Right. They don't know what hump to help over, push over, push back. Or anything. They, they don't understand energy. So I think there are more free market ways of doing this and less, and we should look for the most free market ways to do this. Yes. Um, and, you know, just one example of that is even so there are companies now with financing mechanisms to pay some of the higher upfront costs, but then share in the savings of the vehicle because most of these alternatives take much less money to actually over time fuel. So there's the free market solving this problem. But you're saying there has to be some help to get in to where it. it uh, it has to have time, right? Yeah, all and, yeah. They need time. They need you know infrastructure. Uh, you know, whole. You know, we have a system that's a hundred something years old of gas stations and cars. Of course, that's got an incumbency that makes it very hard, uh, difficult for others. And to this get in. is the car capital of the world. <laughs> I mean, everybody sixteen years old thinks they're going to have a car. Although I'm telling you, uh, autonomous vehicles, vehicles that will drive themselves, that is, uh, I think, over the horizon. You're talking about. Uh, 20, 20 years. I just spent last week in Silicon Valley, and all the automakers have uh, have opened up facilities there. And you've got Apple and Google and oh, wait everyone else. What are they doing? They're literally figuring out how to have driverless cars. And when they look at young people who would rather be uh, texting uh, rather than uh, paying attention to the road, 
Uh, this is why they see this as uh, something. Are, are people going to drive? Are going to ride in these driverless cars? That's that's the the belief. And uh, not this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. um, I was going to say that, you know, if you look at the problem and the people we were able to recruit to do this, um, you know, Fred Smith of FedEx and General PX Kelly, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, really speaks well, to... Well, they're, they're your partners. They, 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 they were guys with vision. Right. And General Kelly started CENTCOM, the Central Command, the one in charge of the Middle East. He uh, started the Rapid Reaction Joint Task Force before uh, President uh, Carter that created this, uh, this problem uh, or this, you know, this entity that was uh, securing uh, supply for the world. When was that? 77? Um, around that time, yeah. Well, it has to be because he went out of office in 80. Right. Carter did. So it had to be right there. Uh, in the late 70s. And then you've got Fred Smith who has, you know, 85,000 vehicles, uh, 900 airplanes and is able to deliver uh, packages around the world uh, overnight. I mean, he Well, create, he can, Fred can an deliver them before they're shipped. <laughs> 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 Teleporting just like those <laughs> autonomous vehicles. That will be the yeah. next thing. But, you know, here's a guy who has the clipper ships of the modern age and if we don't have a, you know, oil is the is the blood of our mobile global economy and he understood why this is such a problem and you know him and General Kelly and yourself you know being people who built this country um, see this as a problem on the horizon it's amazing that my generation can listen and uh, implement what all of you are saying we should do well it's uh, transportation it's here to stay <laughs> and I, I don't know I don't know how you would ever substitute I thought could they if you were in Washington and I was mm -hmm. in Dallas mm -hmm. and our minds met and you wanted to be in Dallas, I wanted to be mm -hmm. we could somehow switch places. Um, I don't think I don't I know if that's in my lifetime. <laughs> I, I know it's not in mine. You don't even want to get into a <laughs> self-driving car. I don't know. Do you want they, to teleport? <laughs> they, uh, well, it, uh, uh, it good conversation. It's uh, we both, I think, pretty well see and understand where we are and what the situation is. Good for America to be energy independent. Um, you know, absolutely, and I, I'm hopeful. I think that having all this supply builds a bridge to a better future where we can have choice for Americans to go to the pump and or decide to fill up on some other fuel type, and that's... Uh, well, we know oil isn't going to be here forever. Right. I mean, every oil field, when you remove the first barrel, Mm -hmm. It is now in depletion. It's now declining. Right. And you remove more and more and more, and then the field depletes. And, and that's going to happen to world oil supply. And even if we don't want to get in that argument, there's enough bad things going on above surface in huge producers of oil that just tell us we should figure out how to get off this roller coaster of uh and get off this roller coaster and the only way to do that is to start filling our trucks on natural gas and you know our cars and other types of fuel so that's i it. love working with you on this and we'll look forward to uh seeing you in the trenches good good conversation thank, thank you. you thank you